joining us today. He is a research associate at the Wells National Estuarine Research Reserve, and he's been in that position uh, since 2004. He's got a, a BS from the University of New England in environmental uh, science and a minor in marine biology. Um, Jeremy's main focus on the reserve is to coordinate the system-wide monitoring program that focuses on long-term monitoring of water quality, nutrient, and weather data, and he also oversees larval fish monitoring. Today he's going to be talking about the Marine Invader Monitoring and Information Collaborative, and it's, uh, it's a pretty cool thing. It's a network of trained volunteer scientists, state and federal workers, monitoring invasive species presence and spread in the Gulf of Maine. Um, having recently gone through training with Jeremy, um, I have to say it's, it's pretty amazing. I mean, it, having you know, lived here and worked uh, on the ocean for a number of years, to get out and start surveying and realize there's so many different invasive species, you're like, wow, this is pretty amazing. You know, typically, you carry on and you don't notice these things, but when you start looking at them, um, you notice that they're not only Um, I'm going to turn it over to Jeremy, and he is a, a very uh, uh, vivacious speaker. Thank you, folks. Uh, thank you for having me tonight. It's my pleasure to be out here on Long Island. Um, so, yeah, I've had the distinct pleasure of getting involved with the island community since 2014. Um, so, as John said, I've worked uh, for the Wells National Expert Research part of a system of reserves funded by NOAA. Right. Um, I know that's going to be a little bit of a dangerous word to be spotting out around here, but I can assure you that I do not have a governor of I do not have management or regulation stuff. So, uh, but uh, yeah, we're funded through the National Ocean and Atmospheric Administration. We're specifically focused on estuaries, so areas in our country where rivers meet the sea or where the Great Lakes. <laughs> where rivers meet the Great Lakes, we actually have freshwater estuaries, but we'll see that for another talk. Um, but yeah, we're one the country to um, kind of protect. This is our site down in Wells, so if anyone been to Long Home Farm down in Wells, man, awesome, look at that, I love those hands. Yeah, if you haven't been, go check it out. Um, perfect place for you guys, speaking of conservation, great group of folks, Long Home Trust got together and saved this beautiful saltwater farm back in the 80s from development. Noah came in and said, okay, we can set up an extra research reserve here, we just need to match that federal funding every year. That's how the trust was formed. Most other escrow research reserves throughout the country are supported by either a university or a state agency. We couldn't find that in Maine, so we relied on volunteers and community folks to form that trust, and we match that federal grant every year to keep this on operation right. So volunteers are a huge part of what we do, and again, I really appreciate all the efforts that go on with you folks here in the room, because uh, protecting land in Maine is very important, especially southern coastal Maine, where our population is obviously <laughs> booming and growing every year. So um, I work on what's called the Maine Coastal Ecology Center there at the reserve, and we're focused on fisheries and habitat monitoring. So coastal uh, monitoring is kind of our our key. And again, NOAA is um, when I joke sometimes that NOAA is the national office for the advancement of acronyms, but that's not the case there. <laughs> they do a lot of monitoring for sure. The National Weather Service, the Hurricane Center, is all under NOAA. We also host a ton of interns, students, undergraduates every summer um, who come do research and help us fulfill our mission as well. We try to do hypothesis-driven research, you know, science that informs, helps our communities better understand um, the habitats that they're living in and working in every day. So again, our big major programs at the reserve, we have an education department, does kids camps, junior researchers, also has uh, harbors our coastal training program. So this program specifically works with municipalities, managers, and towns to convey the science that us and our other federal agencies are doing to the people who need to understand that science and use it to inform, inform coastal management. Um, we also have a stewardship department, so I hear a lot of work about invasive species out on the islands, managing those species, that's all stewardship, right? So as we protect the land, as we, we put places aside, we also want to maintain those properties and make sure that they're um, accessible and safe out there. And of course, we have a research department, which I'm involved with. Um, go ahead. 
So as John mentioned, I run something called the System Wide Monitoring Program, which is that place that all 30 reserves around the country were collecting the same things the same way, using the same instrumentation at all 36 of our reserves around the country. The main part of it is abiotic monitoring. So keeping our finger on the pulse of the water quality, the weather, the nutrients in our estuaries, all those things that kind of drive the production and help support um, what we think of as our resources in those natural systems, so the fisheries and the plants and the water quality and all that stuff. But we also do some biological monitoring, and that's where the invasive species piece kind of falls in. I'm lucky enough not to have to just look at the human turbidity and pH data all day and water temperature data, but I also need to go out in the field and actually look at marine invasive species. But I don't know. So I want to set the stage here a little bit. I know a lot of you are well aware of this, but our colleagues and partners at the Gulf of Maine Research Institute have been doing a wonderful job of tracking um, what we'll call temperature anomalies or marine heat waves that have been occurring in the Gulf of Maine. And these graphs go a little bit to show you what's happening here. Uh, the Gulf of Maine is actually one of the fastest warming bodies of the world. It's warming at an alarming rate. Um, 2012, we had this temperature anomaly. We had huge spikes in surface waters in the Gulf of Maine. And people were really shocked. And that's um, illustrated much of the World War IV for you. Illustrated by this graph here. Um, this is a long-term temperature trend graph using sea surface temperatures from Boot Bay Harbor that go back to the late 1800s, early 1900s. And you can see that, yes, although temperatures go up and down, and we have cold winters and we have warm winters, and the general trend, especially the general trend over the last few decades, is a very alarming fast rate of water temperature rise. So you can go more for me. Um, you can go ahead and click again. This is the temperature, the 2012 temperature anomaly. What you're seeing here is degrees above or below our historical average Gulf of Maine water temperatures, is what this graph is seeing, to break it down a little bit. So, you see, we go post-1990, um, a few decades back, right? We have all of these temperatures where sometimes we have anomalous cool um, seasons in the Gulf of Maine. Sometimes we're a little anomalously hot. And to say that a degree of temperature is a big difference, it is in the Gulf of Maine. I know a lot of times people think, oh, it's only one degree, it's only two degree. But when we're looking at averages, that means that we had a lot of points that were way above <laughs> our, our initial average. What I want you to see here, if you click one more time, Michael, is that since 2007, we've really had no anomalous cooling periods in the Gulf of Maine. Everything's been above that historical line. And the stuff that really freaks us out is the last couple of years, uh, 2021 and 2022, were some of the warmest seasons, warmest on record in the Gulf of Maine. We're approaching those 2012 temperature anomalies that shatter historical records. So why does this all matter? Go ahead. So it's not just the summer stuff. I'm sorry about the data heavy slides here, folks. I'll get through these in just a second. <laughs> but it's not just the summer temperatures. The fall temperature is also starting to take a long time to come down, right? And we're seeing this in the plankton blooms that happen in the Gulf of Maine. So we have a spring bloom and a fall bloom that kind of fuels the, um, the life in the Gulf of Maine. And we're seeing that a lot of times that fall bloom is being moved or being repositioned. That's something called phenology. When we see a natural event start changing when it happens, and something that's been happening relatively routinely for many hundreds of years, um, that scares us. So it's kind of a uh, fucking job. It's an amazing but also terrifying time to be a scientist in the Gulf of Maine because things seem to be uh, changing on a very rapid scale, uh, faster than we've ever seen in historical data. This has been covered well by NASA. Um, go ahead, John, or um, uh, Michael, one more, please. And as well as in scientific literature, so this is peer reviewed literature. And estuaries, so where we work, what we're looking at out here at Castle Bay, these are the places where we're expecting to see the most extreme effects from climate change because they're generally more shallow, there's more human disturbance there, and um, this is something that obviously we want to keep an eye on. So, just to get you guys into the idea of marine invasive species, in Maine, we have a pretty good terrestrial and freshwater species programs, right? So, you folks are doing work on the islands with terrestrial species of plants. Right, that are taking over. Um, we have the Lakes Monitoring Program, which has been doing awesome jobs in our lakes and uh, rivers in Maine. But in the state of Maine, which has more coastline than any other country, except Alaska, think about that, right? So all of our nooks and crannies and piers and harbors, out of all that coastline, I can think about maybe five, six people in the state of Maine who are actually being paid to deal with marine invasive species. So number one, it's kind of an underfunded um, issue that we're dealing with. And number two, it's, uh, it's a difficult habitat to work in because it's a, I mean, it's a very big, open, 
area, and we're dealing with ocean currents and the way these things move around. So let me get you into marine invasive species a little bit. Um, number one, what makes something invasive? So we kind of use three rules in the marine world. One, they have to be absent from the historical record, right? So if they haven't been there, that's obvious. They're not native, they're not in the fossil record. Right? Number two, they have to have come here from some kind of human factor or human influence, something that we do to move them around. So just like plants and all the stuff that you look at in the aquatic world, they're generally brought here by some kind of human activity, right? And number three, they have to have some kind of negative impacts on the places that they're invaded. And those are generally on uh, other species or on um, the economy or on fisheries of the source. So in North America, we have 300 marine invertebrate invasive species and 100 species of invasive fish. In the Gulf of Maine alone, we have 85 reported in, um, invasive marine species right now. And that number is growing uh, pretty much every year. So what are the vectors of these things? The biggest vectors are shipping. Right, so we have ships traveling around the world. Everyone knows about the green crabs, right? They've been here for a long time, kind of the poster child of marine invasive species. I see a lot of that now. So those came over ships. Those came over the ballast water of ships. So when ships take up water in their home ports, they also suck up larvae, eggs, and sometimes even juveniles of species, right? They used to come right over across the ocean into our waters, then dump that down into our harbors, right? So that's how we think a lot of our early invaders showed up here was through the shipping industry. We now have the Ballast Exchange Water Act, which makes ships stop offshore, cycle their water with clean ocean water, and release that when they get into their harbor. So we do have some management things in place in the marine side of the world where we're trying to get at at least preventing the invasions from happening. Go ahead, Michael. And these are also some tough species to work with. So we have some algae, we have some crustaceans like crabs, which are pretty easy to ID. But how many people have you known what a tunic is? <laughs> or a bryozoic, right? These are animals that are not people aren't used to seeing or dealing with, right? They're not in your face every day. So um, tracking them and understanding their complex life history <laughs> is often one of the biggest challenges we face with um, dealing with these species. But let me ask you, how many people here have a dock or a boat um, near their house that they visit all the time? How many people have ever pulled something up or pulled their boat up in the air and have orange globs on there, or stuff just growing, right? Most of that stuff is invasive. I'm going to talk to you about some of those species on here today. They're not supposed to be here, and they're really taking off as the Gulf continues to warm. So, what is MIMIC? So, John mentioned that he's been trained on this program called the Marine Invader Monitoring Information Collaborative. Both. So, we call it MIMIC. MIMIC is groups of trained volunteers, scientists, state university workers, staff that monitor for marine invasive species along the entire New England coast. We actually have teams all the way down to Rhode Island and all the way up to Maine. And we monitor three major habitats, docks, tide pools, and rocky intertidal. That's where we find most of our marine bases. And the goals of the program are a few. So one of them is early detection. So the best way that we can manage invasive species is when we find them early, right before they take off, and really get a sample of the green crab. We're way too late to the green crab, we'll probably never get rid of it, so we have some ideas of how we can start using it. So I'll put those slides in a little bit. Um, educating, educating people, educating community members, the folks who live and work in these environments, about what they're seeing. Um, and also providing data, um, both to the public, but also to scientists and other coastal managers, researchers, so a, a group we're working on why I'm here today working the Escalade Cascade Estuary Partnership is our other federally funded estuary program in Maine, and we work very close with them to do work for Cascade. So um, again, providing them with data on your hangout here um, is, is why this program is in place as well. So here you see the New England natural sites, and on the right are all the groups that help run this thing. So it's a pretty big collaboration that goes from wildlife to reserve. We have um, conservation organizations that have the big programs running, so it's a really cool and pretty well um, monitored site. I'm the main state coordinator. There's the New Hampshire state coordinator. This is run out of the Massachusetts Office of Coastal Zone Management, so the big focus is on the map. But here's our Gulf of Maine, right? And this is interesting because we're monitoring outside the Gulf of Maine, too. A lot of the species that I've discovered in the last five, six, seven, eight years in Mimic have started down here. And we're coming into the Gulf yet. So remember, this horn of Cape Cod is a very important kind of biogeographical feature, right? That's what keeps the Gulf from being cold. You go south of Cape Cod, you're swimming in June, right? North Cape Cod, not as much. So that's what we're interested in, kind of being this northern outpost of these invaders as they move from some more southern, warmer water south of Cape Cod into the Gulf of Maine. Are they staying here? Where are they showing up? 
in our vector system, right? So go ahead. <coughs> this is a little look at our sites that you're making. So as you can see, Castle Bay's got some nice coverage in 2014. Castle Bay's partnership, found a little community for that money, and they wanted to better engage their island communities with stewardship projects, right? And I said, well, we're looking for a species and trying to get these things to get some sites covered. So um, a couple one more time. This is kind of a, a zoom down on uh, Casco Bay proper, um, full south of all Casco Bay, but where our sites end. So we have Shabit Island, Long Island here. We have two sites, one at Fowler's Beach, one right here at the Ferry Dock. We're also on Great Island Island, Peaks Island, and we have some inland sites too at Spring Point Marina and along the Southern Maine Community College Coast. A couple of the mainland sites have been um, monitored since 2008, so we're actually starting to build a pretty nice time series of what's been there and also what's showing up. So this is kind of, again, citizen scientists collaborating with scientists to collect real good, useful information on marine invasive species that we can then um, use to, to inform management. Go ahead, Michael. And again. So we also give our team some resources, right? So how the heck do you go about doing this kind of stuff? We have data sheets that they uh, collect up and with. We also have these really cool ones that ask around so you folks can have a look as I'm talking about these species of, of what we're talking about. And these cards go out, oh, I'm going to just flip through a few slides here. These cards go out um, with our groups and they help them to identify these things in the field. Because again, some of these things aren't stuff we see every day. So the cards have pictures of the invasives that we're looking for, but also pictures of our native common species so people aren't mixing things up, which is important as well. We have a, a volunteer monitor here as well. So, Let's get to some cool stuff, some fun stuff. So what are we actually looking for? What do these species look like? What animals do they represent? So we have crustaceans, right? So we have the big players, the crabs. We have green crabs. When I started Mimic, green crab was the only crab we were monitoring for in 2008. 2011 or 12, they said, hey, down in Rhode Island, we're starting to see these striped shore crabs. They're from Asia, the Asian shore crab, I said. Start keeping an eye out for them. I said, okay, I'll keep an eye out. Remember the first day I found them, like 2010 or 11 or something else. I was like, oh, look what I found. They're everywhere now. They're almost at every one of our sites. So that's the species that I've seen just in a short little period of time completely move into a system and co-inhabit with another invader. So there's a lot of research right now looking at how green crabs and Asian shore crabs are going to compete for the same space that both invaders, which is kind of interesting. But we also have some other weird crustaceans. So we have the pods, right? The isopods, the amphipods, and the copepods. So we actually have some invasive amphipods, um, as well as an invasive shrimp called the European rock shrimp that we're looking for. I'll get to that guy in just a second, too. We also have tunicates. So I asked who knows what tunicates are? No one. So tunicates are filter feeding animals. They can be solitary or they can be colonial, right? And each animal just has a very basic body form. They have a tunic or a covering over their body, but they also have a digestive system where they filter water through, right? You can see some of the pictures of what this stuff looks like. You might have seen some of the stuff growing on. You call them sea squirts. Those are tunicates, right? Go ahead, We also have bryozoans. So bryozoans are another group of colonial animals that filter feed. They like to encrust on things. So if you ever pick up a piece of kelp and you found big little circular rings of white kind of raspy stuff, that's why we're in a part of our nation. That's a sign of that's uh, right down here in the left hand corner called the lazy crusty rhizome, covering our kelp sometimes in the summer. Algae, this is my Achilles heel. Oh, man. Algae are tough to ID. We have a lot of different types of algae, but we're also giving the invasive algae to the coast of Maine. One of them, the most common, is this coating. If you've ever found this thick, green, fleshy stuff growing at the low tide line, they used to call it oyster thieves because when it first came in, it did a number on our oyster thieves who was trying to. Um, uh, maintain that same habitat as they were. So what are we seeing here in Casco Bay? So that's a little intro of some of the species that we're looking at. So here's a great picture I want to show you guys. This is um, impacts of kelp in Casco Bay. So kelp is farmed in Casco Bay, right? So now we're starting to get the impacts of aquaculture, business, people's back pocket. This was a picture from Pete's Island in May 2018. This is a piece of kelp in the water. The white stuff you see growing on is actually a native species of hydrosome um, called Mobilia. So that belongs there, it's not a big deal. Grows in the summer and it falls off by it grows in the spring, falls off by the summer. The picture on the right is that same kelp, not the same exact blade, but a piece of kelp pulled up off that dot from August of 2018. So now our water temperature is way up and you can barely see the kelp. Almost everything you see on that kelp is invasive right there. It doesn't belong. So one of the things that we're facing, if you go ahead and call the slides here, Michael, this one, another picture of kelp from Judith Island. One more. This is from Spring Point. 
over in South Portland that gets all the sugar here from Marina, there's kelp on there, believe it or not. That's kelp related. Everything you see growing on there, all of this stuff, is colonial duodets. All of these are encrusting bryozoans, and none of it belongs. So we've basically been limited to a winter harvest for kelp in the Gulf of Maine right now. Talk to kelp aquacultures, they're not selling a lot of kelp in the summer. They can't harvest this, they can't sell this, they can't market this. One more just bash out of that kelp. We're also seeing the stuff coming up on lots of trains, right? One more. Here's where education comes in. I had a great moment right here on Long Island uh, Dock, and I'll tell the story really quick. I was down there where Mom from from bases. I had a big hunk of the stuff pulled up, and a lot of comes in, and he's pulling the straps off his boat, throwing them on the dock. He goes, hey, he goes, I got that all over my straps, and it grows every summer. I hate it. Oh, what the heck is it? I said, oh, here's, you know, here's my chance, right? So I started talking. I said, these things are called tunicates. They're invasive. They're not supposed to be here. I said, do you mind if I ask how you deal with this? Like, what are you doing? He said, well, I put them up on the dock, and I power wash them before I put them back out. Oh, <laughs> so these things spread by fragmentation. So if you break off little pieces and throw them in the water, it's going to settle and it's going to grow a new copy. So one of the worst things this guy can do is power wash again his traps in the water. Of course, he didn't know that. He's just doing these down. It's just the quickest way to get this stuff off. So he said, oh, man, that's the last thing I want to do. How do I deal with this? Like, I got to have a talk with him. He switches out his traps and brings them back to his house anyway. So he lets them sit for a while as he works on them. I said, don't spray that stuff off. I know this is a tough ask, but can you just bring it back to your house? Let them sit in your backyard for a few days. All that stuff will desiccate, fall right off, and then we're not spreading it all around the harbor, right? So that was a really powerful um, point for me to, again, communicate one-on-one -on -one with someone who's living this, seeing it every day on their traps, wondering what it is, but there's no real information out there from our state or even federal agencies on how these guys are supposed to deal with this stuff or what they are <laughs> or how they're impacting their fisheries. Here's an anchor off of Shadi that was full of uh, the maintenance on top. Again, all of those little tuna kits on there, those are all invasive species. So, you know, a lot of people like that. So, uh, but the guy who has to deal with this now, clean all that stuff off and put it back in the water, that's no fun. So, it's just um, impacting our coastal, our coastal communities for you, go ahead, Michael. So, right here in Long Island, down on Fowler's Beach, we've got that beautiful tide pool, right? So, that big tide pool that opens up in the summer, and I've been lucky enough to be introduced to that a few years ago as one of my mimic sites. So we have a team that goes there once a month and checks for invasive species. This is what we're finding in 2020 on some of the rocks in the tide pools, right? All of these things are invasive species and they were covering a good majority of the tide pool area right there. Um, they were also covering mussels and other native shellfish species that are trying to grow in there. So again, just really thick coverage and we're really interested in why and how these things, pick, where they're going to show up and why they do so well on one island and not so well on another. That's what we're trying to get to with some of our research. And I talked a little bit about some new species we're finding. So again, in 2008, no European rock shrimp in the entire state of Maine. Couldn't find one if they held a gun in my head. 2013 in Kennebunk, I had uh, Kennebunk Port. I had a volunteer come up to me and say, what the heck is this shrimp? I took it, I'm looking at it, it's got these bright blue claws, this tiger striping on the back. And I'm like, oh my god, I think that's one of those European rock shrimp. You go one more slide. These are now the most prevalent crustacean in our tide pools in Maine. You go to a tide pool and look, and you see little shrimp shooting all around every time you pick up a rock or something, but all invasive. They were never here about six or seven years ago. And at Wells Harbor, when I pulled this trap out with a, a piece of monitor equipment, there were thousands in the bottom of my trap the other day, just thousands. So, you know, I was talking to John about monitoring programs. Generally, we need to collect data for a very long time to pick up on change, because it takes a long time for these biological changes to happen sometimes. And the scary thing is, is we're seeing this stuff show up and not only really just arrive in Maine, but do really well and take off in a matter of five, six, seven, eight years. Um, kind of what things run fast forward. Diplosoma is another type of tunicate that I've never seen in, in the Gulf of Maine until three years ago, and now it just seems to be everywhere. It's completely the dominant tunicate now at our dock site has come in the last two or three years, and again, we're trying to understand if and how this is going to displace either other um, invasive species and what kind of impact it's having on the kelp and on the things that it follows or collects on, right? And we also have a new species of tuna that we just found uh, a year ago that um, we're wondering why the heck it's up here because the closest north it's been found is Maryland. And we have potentially two species growing in South Portland, right, where a lot of boats come in from other areas. Not set up shop yet, but things that we're seeing in the environment here. So, we collect all this data, and I know a lot of you are saying, well, what's the so of all? Right, like what can we do? How is this data being used? One of the ways it's being used again is by our partners, um, Casper Bay Partnership, which has a state of the bigger report every year, right? And they look at everything from 
water quality, the biology, the land use. They have a nice spotlight on invasive species. Um, now that we've gotten six or seven good years of data from our Cascade Islands, we felt like we could work with them a little bit. So with that slide, Michael, we were able to work up some trends, where we're seeing the most um, invasive species, what kind of invasive species are making up the, the most of the so two kids are leading the crustaceans close behind. We have crabs and shrimp and all those things. Um, but that's not the full story. So this is my Dr. Seuss slide. Um, I had to throw this in here because I'm also working with island communities on another invasion of a whole different sort. So we have one crab, two crab, green crab, blue crab. So we all heard green crabs, right? We also know about blue crabs from the Middle Atlantic. Well, in 2020, we started capturing blue crabs in the, uh, in the Gulf of Maine and our salt marshes and wells. I've worked in wells since 2003 as an intern, and uh, we dragged tons of nets, baited tons of pots. I've never seen blue crabs in those marshes, ever, ever, ever. And all of a sudden, in 2020, we start trapping them up, right? So, is this a range expansion or is this an invasive species? That's a whole different conversation because it doesn't meet those three criteria. So I don't think it was brought here by boats or anything. This is a range expansion. This is a species that's normally found south of Cape Cod, making their way up into Casco Bay, the Gulf of Maine. They've been here before as adults, but the disturbing part of us is we start to find their larvae. So, we, I also do a larval fish collection, and as part of that, we get crustacean larvae as well. We have blue crab larvae going all the way back to 2014. Go ahead. Which means that they've probably been here a lot longer. This is the shot I took on my microscope um, from the reserve. This specimen was collected in the summer of 2014. The big indicator here are these two huge spines that come off the back. If you've ever seen a blue crab, they got these big spines off their uh, carapace or their body that go off to the side. Once I saw that, I knew we had something that wasn't local to our things. We looked up and sure enough, we had a blue crab larvae um, showing up in our things. Here are some of the adults um, in the marshes down in Wells. These things are voracious predators. They are super, super aggressive. I've never had a crab that acts like this before. It just wants your fingers, it wants blood. Um, they, in their native habitat, they're what we call apex benthic predators. They live on the bottom and they're top dog. They eat anything that moves, including their own young. Lobsters are the same thing here. Lobsters are pretty nasty. <laughs> they'll eat their own, they'll eat each other, they'll eat anything they have to survive. What are these things going to do when they start to survive? We already know that our lobsters are having hard enough go at it right now. Um, if we start having a biological range expansion that puts another apex benthic predator right next to our fishery, our most important fisher in the state, that really concerns us from a biological standpoint. So we've got a 2022 Cash Bay Community Grant, and I would like to recognize the two people in the room here who not only helped with Mimic, but are also helping out with our blue crab study. So Patty and Sam Wainwright from Peace Island help out with the Mimic program and our food crab trapping, and Michael Johnson as well is helping us out with our sites here for blue crab monitoring. So thank you folks for doing that because this is a lot of work. Um, there wasn't a lot of money for this. It was money to buy equipment, money to cover my ferry fees, <laughs> to hop around the islands all summer, poor me, um, but also to um, help get us understanding where the adults are, where the larvae is, and also using a new method called eDNA. So eDNA allows us to grab water, run it through a DNA, so we can the forensics, right? See what was there over the last 24 hours. It's a very basic explanation, but it's a potentially very powerful tool. If you think of the amount of time and manpower it takes to go out and actually physically look for species, if we could just go out and collect water samples and understand what was there over the last 24 hours, that could be a huge tool in tracking these things. So we're working with you, Maine, the reserve, as well as the National Exploratory Partnership. We've been trapping and um, sampling every week since June on, on this project. So that we've engaged um, some of the school children in this as well. So we had Marcy Tram, if anyone knows Marcy, came down with the, uh, with the school kids help us get the traps out. And they're going to help in the fall to do a little EDNA sampling as well. This is a young gentleman doing one of our uh, EDNA samples here. So you basically then just pull up water, you push it through this little filter, all the water through this filter, you're going to bag that filter. Freeze it, and we can run that filter for DNA analysis see what was in that water. The adult traps, right? Looking at the adults, we gave our uh, <laughs> gave our <laughs> tongs. These things are really nasty. We're gonna ask volunteers to go out and handle crabs, which should at least not have them coming back all bandaged up and lost fingers, right? So this is someone properly in one of our crabs. We're also looking for that larvae, right? The baby baby just hatched from eggs. Because if we see the larvae, we know that the adults are around and reproducing. And that's what these blue things are on the side of the traps. They collect that larvae that's in the water. We then rinse them out into a bucket, get them into a little jar of alcohol, and our friends at Inmate can help us 
Um, go ahead and do those. So here are all the leaders at work. You might see some familiar faces in there. This is uh, Stephen, uh, Ben, and Steve Johnson from Shabi helped us out on quite a bit in this monitoring, as well as our folks on Peaks, and again, just folks on getting this equipment out in the bay this summer has been a lot of fun. It's also a get down here out to the Long Island community. It's just been really neat to work with. So I want to go over a quick case study with you guys, and I'm going to stop talking and take any questions you guys have about this stuff. So go ahead. So, Green crabs and mink, right? So green crabs are kind of the most to shut out for invasive species. This is a graph I worked up out back of our thing. So it's one day of tracking <laughs> that we did in three different systems looking at the movement of, of uh, green crabs around our state. Wells is loaded for some reason. We're not sure why. Dan was got ahead and him out in Yarmouth. We did the same amount of traps, same kind of trapping. Didn't have a ton of crabs. But the next slide. But this is a new looking at water here. So this is a picture from 1953 out of Ipswich, Massachusetts. 58 bushels of green crabs trapped in three days at Ipswich. They've been trying to monitor or take care of the species for a while. What's really interesting about this is in 1953, I'm not going to do this to you, but if we went back to that heat temperature and I want to grasp, <laughs> guess what happened in 1953? We had a marine heat wave. There was this huge marine heat wave in 1953. And guess what we stumbled across just about three weeks ago? A paper from 1953, the first sighting of blue crabs in Pennsylvania. And we went, cool, <laughs> like we're not the first ones to find these things, but here's the deal. After that temperature anomaly, they were never seen again in large numbers until just very recently. This 2012 temperature anomaly moving forward. I think what happens after that 53 anomaly, things kind of went back to normal. Gulf of Maine had cooling periods, had warming periods, kept things in check. Over the last 30 years, we have not been Next slide. They also um, try to manage with things. So my favorite was the pesticide laden fish barriers. So they used to soak fish in pesticides and string them up in the hopes that the green crabs would eat them and die. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know much about chemicals and how they persist in the environment. <laughs> this would not be something that DMR would be regulating right now. But they did do barriers. So I don't know if I'm even sure some of the work they're doing in Freeport about excluding green crabs from plant flats to try to keep them out. This was an idea they were trying all the way back in 1953. It's a little hard to see because of the size of the picture. But all these little holes in the mud flat here are where crabs are searching and hunting for clams and feeding. If you can see this a little bit better, there are none of those pot marks inside of that enclosure. It's pretty impressive. And I actually partnered with a guy named Dr. Brian Beal. He's from Beal's Maine. <laughs> Go figure. And he runs uh, one of the largest clam hatchers in the state. He actually provides most of the clams for all the towns that do any kind of seeding and things like that. So Brian and I and a bunch of us helpers went out of the wells where we have tons of green crabs, and we put these six-inch flower pots in the ground, right? And we filled them with 12 hatchery clams. Cool thing about hatchery clams is you can track them. You can tell them from wild clams because when they enter the uh, natural environment, they form a new growth rate. It actually looks like a little thumbnail on their back. It's the best way I can tell. But you can tell a hatchery clam from wild cocoon. Kind of, that'll be important in a second. So we did a bunch of different treatments on these. Some we covered top and bottom, some we left open to predation, and we put them out for six months. Go ahead, Michael. So this is, uh, we then collected those pots after the summer, brought them all back, dumped them into sieves, and rinsed them down to see what we had for clams remaining, right? This was a pot that was left wide open, no exclusion for predation. Didn't have a single clam in it, not a single clam. This was a pot that was closed on the top and the bottom from predation. I say the bottom, that's important because we have milky ribbon worms in Maine. Those are a natural predator on the clam. We have to take that into account, right? So we want to know if milky ribbon worms are back too. We had 467 wild clams settled in this pot and grown out to a uh, harvestable side that have grown. And if you can see here are our hatchery clams. See the ones with those black? Marks on the back, so we could pick out all 12 of our hatchery clams and we had to survive. We also got 467 wild group clams in the absence of predation. So that was a pretty good indication that the green crabs were the ones that were a huge number on um, this species in particular. And what does that mean? This is a quick graph of 2020 commercial main landings by species, right? So, what's the big blue one? Lobsters, of course. But somewhere hidden in these little slivers, is soft shell clam right here, three percent. So people might think, well, three percent is a huge part of our fishery, right? But if you do the math on what three percent is of 516,796,611, it's a ton of money. 
It's a, it's a big economic draw for the state, and it's a good part of our fishery. That number has been decreasing steadily um, since the 50s. One more quick thing about uh, green crabs. They like to destruct habitat for some reason. So they've been burrowing for our marshes. Down in Wells, we're seeing a lot of marsh slumping from this activity. We think that they're trying to get away from the cold winters. That's how they survive, by getting in the marsh. But they're also doing a number on eelgrass. Again, kind of hard to see, but this is a picture of Wukoi Bay in 2001, Northern Casco Bay. Um, lush eelgrass, pretty much covering the entire bay. Now remember, this is post-2007, when we were still having some anomalous anomalous school periods of the Gulf of Maine. We're still kind of seeing what we would consider normal Gulf of Maine fluctuation. Come 2013, the big boom of green crabs, we did not find a blade of um, seagrass, eelgrass um, in that entire day. So Hillary Nichols, go ahead, um, did this study, where she actually excluded, again, green crabs from certain areas in those bays. And sure enough, where she did those exclusion, those grasses were growing great. So, What's next? So I hear a lot about invasive species management. People are pulling plants, they're blocking off ponds, they're doing actual management steps. Again, this is a little harder in the marine world, so this is one of the toughest questions that we face. But we are working with local fishermen, so we're working with a man down in Wells. Um, Everett Leach, who has been tracking crabs, he has a couple restaurants, one in Portsmouth from Portland that are buying from him right now. They're making stocks out of the crabs. But generally, these things are too small to pick, right? Taking a lot of meat out of a little green crab. So we're trying to figure out how we can utilize these things. One more slide. The big thing, I'm sorry, go back one more. I'll finish up. The big uh, market where green crabs are native is soft shell, right? So everyone loves a nice soft shell crab, maybe on a sandwich or something. Um, where they're from in the Mediterranean, the soft shell green crab industry is a huge thing. But it relies on fishermen who've been doing it for generations and can tell when a crab is going to bolt. They take those crabs, they put them aside, they hold them in a tank until they bolt. Then they take those freshly molded crabs and they sell them for premium money. So one of the big research projects we have going on at the reserve right now, I'm sorry, I don't have a slide on it, is our research coordinator who is a crustacean person is drawing blood from crabs and trying to see if you can pick up on a protein level change to pick up on when they're molting. Because if we can trap crabs, hold them, and sell them right after they bolt, we can make a really good business out of these things, and once we start fishing for something and eating them, we'll be protecting them in a few years, probably. So, a good way to start managing the green crab problem is to start putting them in our bellies. I've actually had soft shell uh, green crab fried. I've also had green crab stock. They're both delicious. They stand right with other uh, crab species. So, um, oh, uh, this is, uh, that's a little bit about what MIMIC's all about. I know there was a lot of information to take in, but at the same time, you know, we're on islands, right? And, uh, we deal a lot with invasive species outside the website. I saw your great uh, resources, educational resources on invasive species, but I noticed there's nothing there for marine, right? And we're on islands. So our terrestrial partners, of course, are very important, but we're on islands, we're worried about our coast too. And I would love to work with you folks if we want to have a little bit on marine invasive species on the website moving forward. We can work up a little, a little uh, session on that. But also to know if anyone's here is interested in monitoring, I'm looking to add islands to the MIMIC program. So if you're on an island that's not represented, or you saw that map, you said, hey, I have a dock down there that could fill a gap, or that, you know, a cool site that we can monitor. Please let me know. In touch with you, we'd be happy to get you trained. Ask John, it's not that bad, right? Once you get trained and start looking, it's like, whoa, look at all this stuff popping out at me. And, you know, you're all naturally leaving, right? Right? I consider it's all natural. So we're outside, we care about our environment, we care about protecting land, we're looking and observing. That makes you a naturalist, that makes you a perfect fit for this program. <laughs> so please come find me if you're interested in anything like that. And, um, yeah, thank you so much for your time. These are my invasive species. This is uh, Mabel and Lucas. Uh, they're 10 and 7, and they're doing their best to, you know, um, eat their way out of the world, too, and find their stronghold. So, anyways, <laughs> I appreciate your time, folks.
<laughs> but at the same time, seeing more and more southerly species not only show up in the Gulf as adults, but when we're picking up on their larvae, that means they're around and they're reproducing. Because the larvae aren't being passive and transported out from there. So the fish is on the other side of the gas, and that could very well be a fish that's expanding its range in the southern Massachusetts from the middle of that they've never seen before. And we have that going on as well. Yeah. I mean, more than Yeah, there's not enough blue crabs here to impact the fish. 
picture again. Yeah. The fact that we're seeing them in any kind of numbers, not just show up in Gulf of Maine, but reproducing is what freaks us out. So again, they've been spotted in the Gulf of Maine sporadically over the last many, many decades. You'll hear accounts a lot from them pulling one up or something like that. And they'll like, <laughs> real simplistic, but like, you know, in the laboratory, like putting lobsters and blue crabs together. Yeah. You win, you know? oh, so that's a great question. Oh, so yeah, yeah, so one of the first things we look at is there any scientific studies that look at the overlap of blue crab and lobster? It's never happened before. Because the blue crab were full, so far south, you remember the New England lobster fishery is on a long island, <laughs> right? So those those species never crossed paths. By the time they moved north, the blue crabs moved north and expanded, expanded their range through the Long Island Sound into southern Massachusetts. The lobsters were more or less already gone. So there's no great field experiments, and I don't know of any good physiological experiments looking at lobsters and crabs. Uh, I'm sorry, crabs and uh, yeah, the crabs and lobsters interact with each other. Yeah, it's a great question. Well, hopefully that's going to be in the science soon. We literally feel like uh, this discovery of three years worth of adults in our marshes mixed with six years of larval data really is the first compelling scientific evidence that blue crabs are in the Gulf of Maine more than just uh, haphazard ones off. This is really, to be honest with you, brand new stuff. <laughs> and again, uh, exciting and horrifying time to be scientists in the Gulf of Maine because as I've been in this career for 20 years, it's not a super long career, certainly not on geological time scale stuff, but to see habitats changing, to see species, whole new species not only show up, but take off and proliferate. Yeah, pretty crazy stuff. Shocking. Thank <laughs> yeah. you. I brought a lot of industry people together to talk about specifically how we can manage 
a problem in that. It spurred a whole new the market and you may looking at new use of, of green print. So small steps. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. How much impact does balanced water from ships traveling the world impact the importation of the basis? Yeah, it's huge. It's the number one vector of the basis. We're one of the very few countries that has a balanced water exchange act, and it's only 10 years old, or 15 years old. We finally convinced Congress to, again, hit industry over the head a little bit and say, sorry, guys, but you got to stop. You got to exchange your water. You got to uh, play by the rules here when coming into ports. Because we're exchange the water works. Exchanging it with what to where? Yeah, so when you get out to the open ocean, the water you've taken into your ships is from estuaries where a lot of things are growing, eggs reproducing. The open ocean, anywhere like 200 miles offshore, is actually a pretty biologically um, undiverse area. There's not a lot of stuff in the water out there because, again, most of our species that we're concerned with are coastal. They're in the continental shelf. So once you're out in the open ocean, you can suck up ocean, open ocean water and have very few critters in it. So what you're doing is you're taking this water from uh, diverse estuaries where there's crabs and shrimp and fish and all these things, and you're exchanging it with water from the open ocean where there's very few things living in that top floating zone. Um, so yeah, that's how, that's why it works. You're sucking up kind of open ocean water, which is much cleaner than coastal water. And they introduced the invasive species from the coastal area. They, yeah, to the open ocean. They won't survive. Yeah, they won't survive. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes? Is there any negative side of the uh, increase in the water. The water noise starts European oysters. Yeah. Those fluted oysters. Yeah. Are, they, are they competing with the other species yeah. in a way that's negative, or are they just a, you know, a new arrival? Yeah. So they're not a new arrival, actually. Uh, so the European oysters came into the Damascot River in the 70s, and they were brought in for aquaculture. So they were purposely had human brought here and dropped it. So we're going to grow with these things. And then, of course, they get out of that river and they're all along the coast of Maine. That's a good example of a, like, how are these guys playing a role? Are they really being detrimental to our environment? They clean water after all, right? And are they coexisting with our native species, or are we finding less of our native species and more of the invasive? And if that's the case, and one out competes the other, do we care? Um, I don't know. I'm not a, a super shellfish biologist. And, uh, so when we get to those specific species questions, I sometimes we defer to the experts and say, well, what's the selfish expert say? What does the aquaculture say? Do you care if we're eating European oysters versus um, our, our adventurous one is our, our native species? Is there more meat in one than the other? Does one more efficiently clean water than the other? I'm not sure about that. Uh, but that's, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, there was a, one example I gave you is those little tiny amphipod things I showed you. They're called the um, skeleton shrimp. They really come out. If you pull stuff up, you can see them kind of on the ropes. It's kind of creepy and nasty. I can't give you a good reason why we should be deathly scared of skeleton shrimp. So when he asked me what's the thing, we said skeleton shrimp is not on top of my list. He's like, well, I think they've displaced our native species because I can't find our native skeleton shrimp anymore. But again, I go, no, oh, they're grazing on the epifauna and the fallen demon. And one will replace the other? I can't give you a good alarm on why that matters. So the oyster is a, a really interesting question. Um, it's definitely popular in our bays and, and coves, and I don't know really how that's affected our native species as far as competition for space and or if people really care which kind of oyster they're eating. Some of those species are very similar. Yeah. They don't? No. Yeah. I am not. See, so I am not an oyster <laughs> No, I'm eating raw shellfish because I understand their biology. <laughs> But it tasted like the marsh smells to me. Very briny and fresh and very briny. <laughs> when I brought back to it, but uh, it didn't make me gay. So. <laughs> trying to sell myself on the but I just can't quite do it. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the one thing I guess I would just think about these uh, things are brought into the environment. You have all these unintended consequences. So for the one that works out right, it's dead, it's just super. Oh, no, oh, absolutely. That's right. Yeah, sure, sure. That's the danger of trying to manage biology yeah, and biology sometimes. Yes. So the, the point I want to bring home to you guys tonight, so we'll wrap up and get going, 
here is that, you know, the, the marine invasive species are a very real thing in Maine. They're, they're having impacts on our economy, on our recreation, on our fisheries, uh, but they're not paid as much attention to <laughs> as other, and I think part of that is because of some of the species and stuff I showed you. It's kind of a focused area. Um, everyone can um, understand plants a little better than tunicates, I think, and they're also a lot tougher to manage, but we're getting to the point where at very least understanding where they are, how they're spreading, how their populations are changing can at least put us on the right path to do the best we can with management um, and trying to, again, if we can't stop the effects of these things, we can at least understand them, see them coming and not be caught off guard by them or um, you know, have anyone say that we didn't know, <laughs> right? We can at least uh, prepare ourselves for the inevitable. So, uh, if you have an opportunity to download up around your coach now, hopefully you'll see some of this stuff and you'll be like, oh yeah, that's like something you're talking about. And uh, if you're interested in helping, please get a hold of uh, And again, I think this is important stewardship for your islands because it's certainly hitting your coast pretty hard. So, yeah. John does regular monitoring for the islands every year. He does, yeah. So if you want to take a first step, it's just to touch base with John. He might let you tag along with him for a, a monitoring event so you can feel out the waters. and. Uh, and again, if you're from a different island or don't have someone to contact, please go to Old Dominion. You know? But we appreciate all the help we get from our volunteers. It's what makes this stuff work because um, we couldn't, we don't have the staff, we don't have the State Department, we don't have the federal employees to do this type of monitoring. So more eyes on the road. Yeah. Yeah.